Silo Health Integrations is a series of talks that bring together people who work in different disciplines that converge around psychedelic therapy, healing, entheogenic plants, healthcare, and other important subjects to touch upon psilocybin education, legislation, and integration. Our guest today is none other than the godfather of microdosing, Dr. James Fadman. In this talk, we speak about a variety of subjects including microdosing, the multiplicity of cells, and more. We recommend this talk for those interested in transpersonal psychology and microdosing. We hope you enjoy this informative discussion, and please consider supporting us on Patreon. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for hopping on tonight's Silo Health Integrations event. We are grateful and honored to be bringing on and, and, and sharing space with, with Jim. Feels weird to call him Jim. He asked me to call him Jim earlier. <laughs> but I've uh, got Dr. Fadiman here today, also known as, I believe, the godfather of microdosing. Um, with that said, I would like to uh, invite the audience to please utilize the chat as much as possible. Uh, feel free to drop in where you're calling in from. Uh, and then if there's any questions you have throughout the event, we will do our best as long as they are uh, relevant to the point of discussion, answer them on the spot. And then we will also have a Q&A at the end of tonight's event with, uh, with Jim and Scott and I. So as a, uh, an overview, uh, my name is Saad. I am the founder of Silo Health. By trade, I'm a pharmacist. By passion, I'm a psychedelic advocate, educator, and enthusiast. I believe wholeheartedly in the uh, healing potentials that psychedelics and infusions have to offer. Um, with that, uh, yeah, Scott, please. Uh, I'm Scott. I'm a collaborating partner here at Silo Health. Uh, I'm also in a graduate program for clinical psychology, uh, and I work uh, with veterans uh, who are suffering from post-traumatic stress and uh, military sexual trauma, primarily through a charity called the Warrior Connection. And I am so pleased to be here with Dr. Fadiman today. Um, you know, before we jump into it, I'm, I'm going to fanboy out a little bit. Um, you know, Dr. Fadiman is uh, one of my biggest influences um, in terms of, you know, uh, psych psychedelic uh, therapy. Um, you know, I found the Psychedelic Explorer's Guide at a really important time in my life, and I've passed that book on to um, probably more than 100 people, and I've mentioned it in meetings with psychedelic groups from Atlanta all the way down here to Florida. So uh, it is a distinct pleasure for me to be here with you, Dr. Fadiman. Well, it's a distinct pleasure to meet one of my distributors. It's really wonderful. <laughs> and I'm still waiting for my cut. Well, I'm also very moved that you're working with veterans and with one of the veterans projects uh, because it is, um, I just find the veterans that I've been meeting so impressive. The ones who have not only survived their own trauma, but survived the, the other treatment modalities available. Uh, that, that have failed them. And so um, you're working with, you're working with heroes uh, of, a, of a very peculiar sort. Absolutely. Thank you. And, you know, psychedelic therapy um, has shown such promise in helping veterans. And, uh, you know, I've seen firsthand from being in the VA network, um, a, a lot of the uh, pharmacotherapy and some of the uh, I guess, outmoded ways of uh, working with veterans that, you know, really have failed them. And so I'm very hopeful for the future um, for how we can begin to treat these heroes. Well, since you guys aren't going to ask me this, because no, almost no one knows it, um, we, um, we have a couple of cases, we being Sophia Korb, my colleague and I, of veterans who have had paralysis, at least from the waist down. And this came to me uh, literally with a YouTube with some guy talking, some very athletic guy who had developed, I think, a better wheelchair for cross country something or other. And what he suddenly said in the middle of his discussion was that when he microdosed, his legs moved. Okay. Now, they hadn't moved for a couple of years. And it didn't move. After, I didn't know, I couldn't track him down, but there is one VA that got very interested because um, we all know that can't happen. So when it does, it suggests that our theory is wrong. So I just want to slip that into your veterans world um, where it'll probably find uh, some interested, some people that are interested. Yeah, 
Thank you. Fascinating. So, um, so for the audience, if you don't know uh, Dr. Fadiman, I will provide a, a bio, a brief bio. Uh, so Dr. James Fadiman has been researching psychedelics since 1961 and oh, the effects nice. of microdosing, microdosing since 2010. Uh, as well as holding consult, consulting, training, counseling, and editorial jobs, he has taught in psychology and design engineering at San Francisco State, uh, Brandy, and Stanford, and for three decades taught Sufism and other classes at Sophia University that he co-founded. He has published textbooks, professional books, a self-help self book, a novel, a produced play, and videos, including drugs that children are choosing for national public television. He was featured in a National Geogra Geographic documentary and had three solo shows of his nat nature photography. Wow. His most recent books are The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide, Safe, Therapeutic, and Sacred Journeys, and Your Symphony of Selves, Discover and Understand More of Who We Are, co-authored with Jordan Gruber. Uh, Dr. Fadiman, Jim, absolute pleasure to be hosting you today again. Please, would you be able just to share with us okay. where this all, how this all started and you know what, what led you into the psychedelic space to what you're doing now, please. Well, um, I, I am not uh, an appropriate person for this generation because I couldn't have been less interested in drugs or straighter. Uh, and as a college graduate, um, I, had, I had drunk coffee. I had not, never liked it. So I was that straight. Um, and I was, um, I was living in Paris after graduation, wondering what I was going to do with my life and living as cheaply as possible in a six floor walk up. And my professor from Harvard, uh, Richard Alpert, came through Paris on his way to the first international meeting of international psychological associations of the world kind of thing. Um, and he was meeting up there with Tim Leary and Aldous Huxley, and they were going to present about some of the work they were doing at Harvard with psilocybin. So, uh, Dick said to me, the greatest thing in the world has happened to me and I want to share it with you. And I thought, okay, whatever that is. And then he reaches in his pocket and comes out with a little vial of pills. And I'm thinking, I don't know, man. <laughs> I, I don't know pills. <laughs> okay. But, you know, he's my friend and also he was my professor. And also I can see he's in better shape than I've seen him. So, I take one or whatever size I was given. And we're sitting there outdoors, cafe, Paris, night. And the colors start to get better and richer. And then, and behind me, as people are passing, you know, I, I can hear what they're saying and I, I know what they're talking about, just the way you normally overhear conversations. And then I thought, wait a moment, my French isn't that good. I've been living here about eight months. I've never been able to hear all those conversations. Uh, whoa, something's going on. And, and a, a little while later, I said to Dick, this is too much for me. He said, it's too much for me too. I said, well, I don't understand it. You didn't take that pill. He said, this is my first night in Paris. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we withdrew to my sixth floor walk up and um, enough happened in that evening that blew it, it didn't blow my consciousness open and the whole world didn't turn into love bugs and all those things it was more a just disruption of the way i saw everything so a week later i was in copenhagen having followed them like kind of you know like one of those little dog stories of the lost dog you know goes 800 miles um and had an, another experience and then a lot of life intervened and a couple of months later, I was in California in graduate school and an off-campus group was giving high-dose LSD sessions. And that didn't change my point of view. It changed everything I understood about reality, which was an awkward time to have that happen when you're a first-year graduate student um, planning to stay a graduate student to not be drafted. Do you mind if I ask what insights came to you during that LSD? Oh, well, yeah, the kind of insights that that um, that if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can turn this off right now, which is I was never born, I won't die, um, 
we're we're not all one in some cheerful arms around our shoulders way. We're all one the way the cells in my fingers are friends with the cells in my feet. Yeah. So that and that the natural world is a harmonious place if you allow it to be. Those kinds of things. Uh, let us say that the clinical psychology program that I was in was not aware of much of that, except to assume it was a kind of pathology and that there was a fair number of faculty who were sure that uh, I would go away in some way. And so when I did very well in whatever they set up for me, um, it was disturbing, all right? Mm -hmm. So so, uh, so this was a time when, when really we didn't know much. And I was with a group that probably knew more than any other group uh, about how to work with high doses. So, that left me with no career after I got my PhD and my dissertation advisor who'd been the president of the APA had said, hey, if you do this dissertation, you will not have a legitimate career in psychology. And I thought, okay, <laughs> you know, that's the risks. So that's how I got started. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's crazy. I mean, just to, imagine you know sharing an experience with ron das i mean these, you guys are both legends i mean just picturing it is again th thank you again so much for just sharing the story um so now well, I think the difference is that that there wasn't really anyone to share it with other than the very small group in menlo park i was working with um and so the description i just gave you was one i certainly didn't didn't I didn't talk about that in the psychology department right. uh, because I was perfectly aware of how easy it is to frighten people when you indicate that their reality is small. Mm -hmm. Totally. And particularly when they grade you. <laughs> yeah. So now after you graduated and got your PhD, is that when you started pursuing some of the higher dose uh, psychedelic research prior no. to... No? I, uh, they, I would see I again come from a very peculiar time in the culture. All the research I did was legal. Yeah. Uh, we had permission from the Food and Drug Administration, what called an, ex an experimental exemption to use psychedelics in a clinical way. And the clinical meant people came in, they said, I would like to have a high dose session. We would do a pre interview, and about 40% of them were told no. Huh. And then they had a single high dose session with therapy and before and, and not much after. And we then um, tried to figure out what had happened. And my dissertation was um, four to six hour interviews with about 60 or 70 of these people from two months to a year and, or so out to ask them not the kind of metaphysical stuff that, that is fun, but what were the actual shifts in their lives that mattered? And that turned out to be very little things such as, do you watch television more or less? Mm -hmm. Do you spend more or less time with your children? Do you spend more or less time in nature? Um, has your reading pattern changed? What are you reading that's different? Um, how has your diet changed? What about your sleep habits? How about your sexual habits? What about your religious habits? So we were, I was really asking, um, how does it, not what happened in here, but how did it, how did it work out? Right. And can you share some of the, yeah, some of those results. Hmm? Can you, can you share with us some of those results? Well, um, <laughs> info commercial. Um, there are several chapters in uh, psychedelic research. Um, the psychedelic explorer's guide where for the first time after 50 years or so, I was able to get my, my data published. Because when I finished, this was just as psychedelics were being uh, clamped down. And so uh, the last thing a legitimate journal wanted was a positive article about psychedelics when the government had just declared that on the basis of no evidence whatsoever, they were evil. So the, the general, the general is, is pretty much what you'd expect is people... Uh, were kinder, they were nicer to their kids, they had better sex, they ate a little better, not much. Um, we were not into a very healthy food world for them to choose. Um, they were 
more, quote, spiritual and less religious. Um, they were healthier in a very conventional way. And about half of the people who came through the foundation were highly capable, qualified, sensible people who were interested. And the other half were people that you would meet in an outpatient clinic. Um, so we also had a few people referred to us from the courts. Um, I'll give you actually one little bit because again, I'm not sure where else you can find it. <clears throat> we had a few people who were serious alcoholics. And remember, this is one session. This is not the research you've been reading uh, of two sessions and, and a lot of therapy. This was a little bit of therapy in one session. And in almost every case, the pattern was that within a week after they had had this psychedelic experience, they would go out and drink. And then they would come back to us and say, what did you do to me? And we'd say, wait, wait, we didn't do anything. We just gave you a little experimental drug. And they said, alcohol, ex the alcohol experience was terrible. And we said in our kindest way, you know, maybe your consciousness doesn't feel as good with what alcohol does to it because alcohol is um, technical term, a downer. It's a depressant and it shrinks awareness. That's why you think you're clever when you're not. It takes a lot of shrinking for that to occur. So they then went and stopped drinking. And I had done a certain amount of alcoholism research while a graduate student at Stanford. Um, so I knew the, you know, I knew what worked and what didn't in, in what levels. And it, it turns out, by the way, that the worst possible form of therapy available to alcoholics is psychotherapy. Mm. Wow. And that is about a 2% success rate. And later on, when we're talking about cells, we can see a little bit more why. But for these people, what happened, I think, for all of them, because I see it now in, in some of the ex-smokers and, and other people who give up physically deleterious habits, is their body has more votes. You know, when you're about to take something into your body that you know your body doesn't like, <clears throat> there's that little moment of dialogue where your body says, don't do this. And you say, I want to. <laughs> it's late. It's fun. These are my friends. Your body says, I'll make you sick. <laughs> and you say, okay, <laughs> if I have to do that, but maybe you won't. We know that dialogue. Well, particularly with the smokers, the dialogue is very clear, which is your body says, this is bad for you, period. And the part of you that wants to smoke really doesn't get as many votes after psychedelics. So that's the, that's the situation that we found then, and now we know, we understand more now, that psychedelics allow the normal healing functions of the body, mind, spirit to function more effectively. And once you have a different view of yourself, <clears throat> you have a different view of trauma. For instance, at the moment, my throat is starting to be scratchy. We can all hear it, okay? I don't take that personally. And I don't think, oh God, I'm on a podcast. This brings up the time when I was being choked by my friend at camp. No, it means that my vote, my, I'm a little scratchy and we're going to take a, a, probably at least a minute break while I go get something to drink and bring it back here. Okay. okay. <laughs> One of the advantages of real life podcasts. <laughs> wow. I'm going to take a drink in a uh, much less uh, dramatic way. Cheers. Cheers to everyone at home. What a guy, huh? Yeah, amazing. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really interested um, when he comes back to uh, hear about uh, what it was like uh, when the Controlled Substances Act was passed, because it sounds like a, you know, a lot of really great research that was coming to light uh, just as it happened. Right. And uh, for everybody at home, um, please feel free to keep dropping those questions in, uh, into Q&A, uh, and we'll, tr we'll try to hit them as we're going along. Looks like we've got a couple of good ones in here. Yeah, and we have a lot of people messaging in the chat right now. Uh, direct, if you'd like to share that with everyone, make sure you have that sending the chat to all panelists and attendees versus all panelists if you'd like to communicate with other people, um, the other 50-some people here. But, uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, back. Silver throat has returned. Nice. <laughs>
So, Dr. Fadiman, uh, you were talking about, um, you know, you're, you're getting all these really interesting results uh, in the research, and it's amazing hearing you talk about things where, you know, now when we talk about research, we talk about what's going on in the mind. And it sounds like you were just trying to figure out, you know, what it did to somebody's external environment to actually get to that point. And seeing so many positive things uh, and positive changes in people's life while the government was clamping down at the same time, uh, you know, what what was your experience and what were you going through as uh, the Controlled Substances Act was passed while you were seeing all these positive benefits? Well, I had two levels. One is the idea that you can alleviate suffering um, is what all of us are doing. And whatever we find that works excites us. And the idea that your own government would pass a law saying that what you're doing, you have to stop helping people. Um, just felt, felt very hard to understand. And I do understand it, and it was just as wrong then as it is now. Um, the other side of it is I had put my career on the line, and all of a sudden, you know, it's kind of as if you're, um, you're doing vaccine research, and the anti-vaxxers take over the government. Mm -hmm. And you've spent, you know, a decade getting your all these technical courses and degrees and research and internships and living poorly so you can study vaccines and the government says we don't we're not interested in vaccines um only perverts use them okay it had that feeling and then i i realized that if i'd learned anything about the way the universe was then i could apply that knowledge in a more general way and that began to make it a lot easier because it wasn't, it was never LSD. It was never even the experience. It was the insights you gained from the experience. And those insights, not surprising, have been around for thousands of years. And so suddenly I began to explore religious traditions and shamanistic traditions and mystical traditions um, and, and all of these same points of information that I'd gotten from a, a chemical in Menlo Park um, were there in India and in Tibet and in South America. So, so in a funny way, uh, I personally was liberated from the kind of biochemical medical research paradigm yeah. so that I could look more towards what were the, not were, not were there better ways because in my mind, there wasn't, but where was the, where were the clues that people could use in a much more everyday way? So I spent a lot of time helping to develop what's now called transpersonal psychology, transpersonal meaning through or beyond the personality. And one of the central insights about high dose psychedelic use is that your, your, your identity is not limited to what's inside this, what the Buddhists call your skin bag full of dirt, okay? <laughs> which is, which is Jim Fadiman is, you know, a nice fellow, but there's a larger self. There's a larger version that, that I'm part of. And Jim Fadiman really doesn't understand much about that, uh, but he's got all the vocabulary, so we use him for the speaking part. Okay, now I know I'm sounding a little bizarre at this point, but it's a way of saying that personal identity has been misunderstood, especially in the West. And that misunderstanding has been a constriction of possibilities. What psychedelics do if they do nothing else is they increase your opinion of possibilities so that opportunities which you would have passed by um, you'll look at. For instance, I was recently talking to someone who was applying for a very high level job in a corporation. And we were talking, um, I guess, confidentially. And um, she said at one point, uh, she had a question. And her question was, is when she'd had a psychedelic experience, she had found herself in ancient Egypt and had spoken ancient Egyptian aloud. Now the allowed part being in, you know, in the treatment room or in the living room. And 
she had a question about the possibility of her speaking ancient Egyptian, okay? Now, if I just had my PhD from Stanford in clinical psychology, I just have to suggest that she's cuckoo, right? Because we know that's the technical term. But I also know some research where people who have spoken in languages or what sound like languages that they have never heard of or never heard, when listened to by someone who actually knows that language and they say, yes, she is speaking ancient Urdu or um, an equivalent, in this case, ancient Egyptian, I don't know because I just, uh, but I said to her, that makes perfect sense to me and she immediately felt better because clearly one of her questions had been, was that simply something crazy brought on by a drug or was that something that we don't have good terms for or much understanding about um, in Western psychology? So, so that's a little bit of what, what went on for me is I had a lot of new openings and worked in a lot of areas that most um, academicians never get a chance to work in. At the time, was, was there a lot of backlash to the government's decision to instill the, the Controlled Substances Act? How is, how is that like? Well, the, the backlash would be called the underground. Yeah. <laughs> and the backlash exists today. So that if you simply take one drug, LSD, and one population in the United States, and you say, how many people have taken, in this case, undoubtedly a high dose of LSD since it became illegal? Okay, the answer for the United States is approximately 36 million people. Okay, now if you then take another scale and let's make an education scale, less education, more education, where are those 36 million people going to cluster? Well, probably most of them are in the top 50% of education. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing with the government says there's it's not only bad for you in an indeterminate way, uh, it's addictive, which it isn't, uh, and it has no possible positive uses, which is nonsense. Against that, you have citizen science of 36 million people who said, you know, on the whole, it was pretty good. So, uh, so the culture, you know, so I was not as upset as I could be because, um, what happened, of course, is two things. One is mushrooms, having never been told they were illegal, continued to grow and people continued to use them. And there were some remarkable chemists who um, synthesized LSD, uh, just as Hoffman had, only they were aiming not for experimental doses, but for large amounts. Uh, and I was, I was looking at a quote of someone who worked with Nick Sand, S-A-N-D, one of the early chemists, and he said, we made 100 million doses of LSD. Now, the government eventually said, we would like to put you in jail for that. And they said, okay, you know, it's not, it doesn't make sense to us, but we needed to do that because it felt like the right thing to do. So the, the underground became, um, was very literate. Uh, was very artistically sensitive, was very spiritually comfortable. And a lot of what we associate with the positive parts of the 60s were fueled by that, that awareness. So it wasn't, as, it wasn't too bad. Now, I did end up doing some academic stints in, in some odd ways. Um, so, and I, I look back and I think I'm very lucky that I didn't get an academic career early on because it would have, it simply would have limited, you know, the things I've done in my life. So do you, um, well, I guess two parts to this question. I mean, you, you must feel pretty vindicated um, in uh, what you were doing before. Uh, and also, you know, how do you feel about uh, the, this new psychedelic renaissance and uh, <laughs> how things are going? I mean, everything is still in a gray area right now, but it's very much out in the open. Uh, you know, there are massive groundswells of movements uh, fighting for decriminalization. And you also have medicalization happening. I mean, this must be, uh, you know, just an overwhelmingly great thing to watch happen. After well, yes and no. Underground. <laughs> Overwhelming is the right word. But let's take the first question. Do I feel vindicated? Well, Haldeman, who was one of the henchmen of President Nixon, said in an interview 
that the reason for is that Nixon hated, among other groups, um, hippies, Jews, blacks. He hated various groups. But he understood that you, and he didn't like anti-war people. Um, and he understood you can't arrest people for being Jewish or black or, or Latino or so forth. But he came up with the idea, if you made things that they did illegal, you could then disrupt their lives in all kinds of ways. And what Haldeman said is it was never about the drugs. And we knew that. So I wasn't vindicated. It's simply that the, the establishment, in order to kind of keep its own sanity, never understood that. So over the years, a whole lot of science went up about how bad drugs were for you because they were illegal. So they must be bad. And we've seen it now. Now that marijuana is fundamentally legal in 36 states um, and the, uh, the amount of terrible things that have happened using marijuana have not gone up and the healing power of marijuana has, has been, you know, displayed, uh, nobody is making the argument that the government must have understood something when it made marijuana illegal. And so the same argument is happening with psychedelics, which is the, the step of decriminalization is a very interesting one because it doesn't, it doesn't say we're making something legal. We're saying we're not going to arrest you for existing. It's as if you have a banned book in your house you're not arrested for owning the book. You still might be arrested if you went out and preached from it in a public place. So that um, right now in the states where decriminalization has happened, there have been arrests. There was a wonderful arrest in Denver. Someone went on YouTube and said, I'm in Denver, man, and I'm selling these from my apartment and I'm making about four or $500 a week and I'm doing really good work. Now, Denver's um, decriminalization was you can own it, you can't sell it. So he was basically saying, I misunderstood the, 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 what was going on, and then they arrested him, and I don't think any of us felt bad. And, and federally, and, it's still legal, you know, federally, it's still a crime. So the DEA. Well, they, federally, it's still a crime, but, but again, the question is who have they bothered to get? Mm -hmm. And um, I was on a, a, a large national. TV show once and, and with me, I'm kind of, we were not in the same room, but with me on that segment was a, a drug enforcement administration official. And they said, oh, what do you think about it? And he said, what he said publicly was, all he said was, don't use bad LSD. <laughs> okay, there's stuff out there that's really bad. You should test it if you buy it. And of course you shouldn't buy it because it's illegal. He was a very honest, decent guy who said, you know, if I say don't use drugs, nobody's going to hear me. But if I say don't use drugs that are bad for you, <clears throat> somebody's going to hear me. Off camera, one of the questions he was asked that didn't make it onto the show was, what's your interest in prosecuting people for psychedelics? He said, we have no interest. Wow. And the, the producer said, why not? It's illegal like other things. He said, there's no money in it. Hmm. And what he said, what he meant was, and it's very reasonable, is you're a, you're a drug enforcement officer and you have a, a budget and you have a certain number of officers. And, and how do you show people in Washington that you should get your budget renewed and expanded? Well, if you arrest people who have a lot of money, then you look good. So if you arrest someone who has 10 kilos of pot in his car and a couple of thousand um, doses of an amphetamine and a, and five hundred you know and fifty thousand dollars in cash and three guns you do what you'd find but if you arrest kind of a middle-aged school teacher who on their own in their backyard on a sunday has eaten two grams of mushrooms and this is america they're white and they can afford a lawyer mm. okay so there are very 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 few over the years, over the decades, people who are arrested for these laws. Um, it, what it did prevent was research, safety information, yeah. education, all the things that would make drug use, psychedelic use safer and better. All that was prohibited. Um, and, and 
you know, one has to look at the realistic side of legislation. Just because Congress passes something doesn't mean that reality has shifted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that, Jim. Um, I know I want to be respectful. The Renaissance, the Renaissance, yay, the Renaissance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I want to be respectful of time. I know this uh, event is, is, is a microdosing uh, information event as well. So, so we can get to it. Okay, I'll do the renaissance very quickly. There's a lot of companies out there promising everything you can imagine, um, including, I believe, aging, weight loss, um, other things. And they all are promising that they are working on new molecules because you can't patent the old ones. And some of the companies are doing really wonderful work and have wonderful vision. Uh, and some of them uh, there's, a, there's a term in the uh, business world called pump and dump, which means you inflate the value of something by a lot of uh, advertising. And then you at the top, you, the owners, sell out your shares. And then it, it, the, the actual value of the company becomes visible. The stock goes down very low and the game is over. Some of the companies, unfortunately, look like that as well. So like anything else, there's some wonderful people doing visionary work. There's some terrible people doing a lot of uh, a lot of work they know how to do very well, okay? Mm -hmm. And the one thing we who have gone through this for decades never really thought about is how capitalism would would kind of gang rush the psychedelic world. Mm -hmm. And so uh, lots more research, lots more discovery, um, and lots more hype. Well, so, I think microdosing in particular is going to be kind of hard to get uh, hands on for for capitalists, um, you know, because I mean, if you think about the the protocols that people would be using, it's something that's such a small amount, it would be very easy to home grow. And, you know, I mean, I, if you said it yourself, you can't patent psilocybin, um, you know, how would a company get a hold of that? And, and oh, it's probably not going to go through FDA. Yeah, so. I've, been reading, I've been reading their, you know, their press releases. Um, See, let's take depression. The research says if you give people a high dose and you do a lot of psychotherapy on both sides of it, people's depression will be really gone for six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, three months. Who knows? Okay. That's very expensive. But most of the expenses aren't the drug. Now imagine there's an alternative way for curbing depression and it's using a microdose which is a 10th to a 20th of a recreational dose, like 10 micrograms or a 10th of a gram of dried mushroom. And that's taken every three days. And an equivalent percentage of people get better from depression. But how many, how many times do they take it? Over a month, they'll take it maybe 10 times. Over three months, that's 30 times. Versus the high dose, which is twice plus another six or $8,000 worth of staff. Mm -hmm. There's a market for the small dose. Now, the, the cost of a small dose is very small, but remember, we live in a country where insulin costs $400 a month. That's the same insulin, the identical in, in, insulin from the identical companies, which in Australia costs either six or $9 a month, okay? So the one thing you don't have to worry about is people finding a way to make an excessive profit if they can, given the United States drug regulations. Sorry about that. And yes, home, uh, you know, if I were probably investing in a stock, I would probably look at mushroom growing kits before I'd be looking at some of these companies. And in terms of a clear pathway for like, uh, for legislation, if we want to be, supportive and inclusive to, you know, microdosing uh, practices, that would fundamentally follow along a decriminalization path. Would you, would you say that's correct? Well, um, decriminalization means you're not arrested if you don't misbehave. Mm -hmm. It also says you can't buy it or sell it. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of generosity uh, mentality. And that's something we haven't worked out yet. One of the things that, that Denver is thinking of changing is you can have a substance, 
the change is you can share a substance, right? Okay. That's a big difference in terms of helping people. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that, and I, they haven't done that. That isn't, in, that isn't in their new regulations, but that's what they're looking at. And that's one of the serious questions. And it's a serious question in the California legislation that is at the moment, um, three quarters of the way through this assembly and Senate. And that's a question which is a non-capitalist question. None of the new laws allow any economic um, benefits from, from, from owning, except I think California may say you can't buy or sell the psychedelic, but if you have a service, say psychotherapy, you can charge for that. So it's a little bit like going into the restaurant that says free dessert. Mm -hmm. and, and you say, well, good, I'm coming. I just want dessert. And they say, no, 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 no. It's free dessert with a meal. Oh, so the dessert part's free. So um, let's, let's step back a moment because let me define microdosing. Thank you. Microdosing is using a classic psychedelic, not all of them, but LSD, mescaline, um, psilocybin, for example, at a very low dose, a dose that you will have no classic psychedelic effect. So one of the definitions of microdosing is no, um, no, you know, the sky opens up and angels come down and say, you're terrific. Wow. Uh, the flowers don't all turn and say, he's back, he's back. Okay, none of that. What happens with a microdose is that you go through your day and you notice you've made a few more cold calls and you've done better. You've been nice to that person in the office who never deserves it. At the gym afterwards, you notice you're doing one more set of reps and you forgot you took a microdose. Now I'm quoting one of the people from our, our reports. So microdosing is the least interesting um, kind of inner excitement of psychedelics we've ever found. And it looks like it has a great many possible positive effects for two major groups, people who have problems, physical or mental, and people who don't. Our medical system, as you know, has a real problem, which is they, there isn't a term in the federal government for determining the wellness of a substance. We only, we have a, you know, a, an illness-oriented both medical and psychotherapeutic system. So if you go to a psychotherapist and you said, you know, my life's really working, I wish it was better. The therapist should say, well, I'd be happy to help you, but it's not covered by insurance. Mm. Improving your life is not part of our system. It is in the gym, okay? We're allowed to be physically healthier. Um, so, so microdosing works for both groups. Mm for the people it works for. Does it work for everyone? Not, not that I've ever noticed. For people it doesn't work for, the main, this is the people who, who start taking it and stop. And then you ask them why, and they said it had no effect, or it didn't seem to go in the direction I wanted. Um, we don't have much about negative side effects because when people don't like it, they quit. It's kind of if you go to a restaurant and there's a dish and you eat it and you don't like it at all. And someone says, well, I'd like you to, you know, when you've eaten that dish 10 times, we'd like to have a survey. And they say, I'm not going to eat it 10 times. I don't like it. I say, well, then we can't do the survey. And they say, well, that's not my problem. Yeah. So we don't have a good uh, batch of negative effects to, to relieve the pressure on from the kind of psychotherapeutic world who, who works that way. If you look at pharmaceuticals and you look at the, the, the little, that piece of paper that comes when you buy a pharmaceutical that you can't read because it's an eight point type, it has a list of side effects of almost every pharmaceutical. We're not at that level yet. So far, we, we tend to get positive reports, um, which is a good starting place. Now, in terms of the potentially negative uh, reports, I think I'd like to start there. I think that, uh, I believe you mentioned that uh, tracers can be common in folks with color blindness. Is that, is that right? That's one of my favorite strange side effects, which is um, 
a tracer is if you look at a light source and you change, move over here is you have this this light that follows you kind of the light source follows you it traces itself when you do a sparkler at night you see that tracer effect yeah. um, people who have red green color blindness report that if they microdose they will have tracers for days afterwards and we have on our site, microdosingpsychedelics.com, a note that says we don't recommend people with red, green, color blindness do this. And I have a few reports that people say, yeah, you have tracers, but it's worth it. <laughs> so this is the difference again between what's called, and this is a new technical term, I love it, in the literature, it's called real world evidence. It's what happens after something leaves all the university laboratories and uh, animal studies and, and all of the, the measurements that are necessary for drugs to get registered. The last test is, does it work in the clinic, in the home, whatever? So we like to start there with microdosing and say, what's the real world evidence and work backwards. So, so speaking about the real world evidence, um, what, what are your thoughts about uh, valvulopathy or valvular heart disease due to the binding affinity of the serotonin 2B receptor subtype <laughs> with the class. Well, receptor. for those of you that didn't understand what he just said is there's, there's a little note out in the literature from somebody perfectly nice that took a different substance called ephedrine mm -hmm. that was put into some diet pills and that people were taking on a daily basis for a couple of months, some of whom had enough problems with heart valves that the drug was taken off the market. Okay. Fenfermine or Fenfen. Okay, yeah. Fenfen, right. Um, if we compare the dose levels to microdoses, it's about either a thousand or 10,000, a thousandth or a 10,000th. It's taken less often. And um, so far, with microdosing, we have no evidence, but we do have those 36 million people I've mentioned, also no evidence. Wow. So in a sense, it's saying um, these oranges are gonna stain your clothes with orange juice. Therefore, apples are dangerous. <laughs> so, <laughs> They're fruit, they make juice, they have sugar. You know, there's a lot of overlap yeah. between apples and oranges, but not any that any sane person would, wouldn't would notice the difference. Oh. So it's a very strange um, finding mm -hmm. since there's no evidence for it. It's highly theoretical, you know, it's highly theoretical. Um, do you think that it could be possible, though, as more synthetic uh, psychedelics come to market if they're not? You know, there's no safety or counseling points when it comes to administration or ingestion. Well, um, see, the, the thing we're looking at, see, we're not looking at a pharmaceutical that was made in a laboratory and no one is, and it's a molecule that doesn't exist in the universe. Mm. Even the synthetics up till now are, are analogs of actual molecules. So then you say, well, has, has well, let's take, you know, psilocybin. Has this mushroom ever been used before by human beings before um, Albert Hoffman synthesized it? And the well, answer is, yeah. How often? Well, we don't know how often, but we know for at least several thousand years, mm -hmm. okay? Has there been reports of problems in the several thousand years of any dose level? And the answer is, if you read, say, the Aztec literature on, on mushrooms, they say, when you take a bunch of mushrooms, sometimes you get really crazy and dance around a lot. Sometimes you throw up and sometimes you just want to go quietly and think and then talk to other people about what you've experienced. That's the 15th century um, description, yeah. okay? So the question is, are there people who will do poorly on anything? And the answer is yes. Okay. Remember, um, there's a wonderful chart that the marijuana people carry around and it's causes of death in the United States. And it's, you know, one of these bar graphs and up here is alcohol and tobacco. And, and, and as you get down, you're getting down to, you know, very few. And then right down second from the bottom is peanuts, hundred deaths a year. Below that is marijuana zero deaths per year. 
With psychedelics, we have a couple of interesting cases where somebody, um, there's a recent paper out of Canada, and it was three different people. One had taken like five times the amount of LSD that's sensible for a high dose. Someone else had taken like 40 or 50 times as much, and someone else had taken like hundreds of times more, okay? And the person with hundreds of times of overdose was out of it, not in a coma, but just out of it for like three days. They were just unresponsive. They then recovered no damage, and this person had had chronic mental illness of a particular sort for over 20 years, and it went away. Okay, these are very, according to Professor Nutt, who was the drug czar of England until he wrote about this, these, curiously, and there's no reason they should be, psychedelics apparently are among the safest pharmaceuticals we have, physically. Can you have a bad trip? Absolutely. Can you have a bad trip that would be dangerous for you? Certainly, and people have had them. But by the way, high dose, bad trips, um, huge survey, John Hopkins, they found that people in this the whole, whole survey was on, described your worst trip. And one of the questions was, to what extent was it beneficial or useful in your life? And about 80% of people said it was among the most beneficial experiences of my life. Now, if you had the same survey, which they had earlier, which was your best trip, same question, approximately the same percentage. So we don't really know, we, we, we being people like me, try to, are trying to get the word challenging instead of bad, okay? Yeah. If you've ever done mountain climbing, because you voluntarily wanted to do that, it's challenging. If you were like forced to do it, it's bad. <laughs> Same event, okay? So it's how we hold an experience that turns out to be very important in what we later get out of it. That's why integration is so useful and so important. And by the way, there's also integration for microdosing. Mm. Even though it has these very low effects, there's a number of groups now doing microdose coaching, and it looks like it's very beneficial. Yeah, it seems like it can be. I, you know, one of the things for silo health that's really important to us is harm reduction, and we absolutely agree that you know it doesn't seem like there are any uh, real physical complications that come from heavy psychedelic use, but. Um, you know, having been in psychedelic clubs, you know, I, I do caution people that, you know, high dose, very repetitive psychedelic journeys can oh, cause you to begin to, you know, lose a little bit of touch with, um, you know, certain parts of objective reality. Um, well, it's where it, it's exactly right, which is, um, and it's one of the things I say in the psychedelic explorers guide that people who you were talking about overlook. It says, now you've had this incredible experience. You've had a good guide. You've had good setting. You've got some insights. Your life is working better. And it's now a month later and you think, you know, I want to do that again. I want to go to that place. And it says in my book, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Because what's really happening is there's some inner work that you don't want to do. And so you want to try again to have this, this substance do it for you. It doesn't work that way. And what we know is, well, what we know is, again, overdosing of anything is bad for you. Uh, we know during the period when raves were popular, there were deaths. What were the deaths from? Predominantly drinking too much water. Okay. Right? So we always need to be aware of what are the side effects, but also um, to use common sense. Mm -hmm. And... And one of the questions, for instance, I'm at the moment writing a review of Ram Dass's biography, Being Here Now, amazingly fascinating book, because he was very heavy into psychedelics and then gave them all up. One of the reasons he gave them all up, if you read the book, is he overused them. He took psychedelics way too often with zero integration time. Now, can't fault him because none of us really knew much. But um, I think what I can say is it's, it's, it is likely that people will figure out a way to misuse anything. High dose psychedelics are relatively easy to figure out how to misuse. 
Microdosing is harder, but I'm sure people will find a way, okay? I was once working for a number of years as a, in, a, in a design engineering department at Stanford. And the other faculty who had engineering backgrounds would often do expert witnessing for cases where somebody sued. You know, I put my hand in the washing machine and it hurt my hand and I'm suing you. And what we learned is that there, there's a term, a term of art called idiot proof. And what I learned from these professors is no one can design something so harmless that some idiot can't figure out a way to hurt himself. So psychedelics, which don't cause physical damage can certainly be misused and people have done so. And it's always our job to both educate and in high doses to protect people. Great. So um, I kind of want to uh, switch gears here a little bit, uh, Dr. Fetterman. Um, so one of the things that I tend to relate to people uh, when they ask me about like my own personal journey with psychedelics is about how, um, you know, there are parts of me that, um, you know, sometimes are very depressed and sometimes are very anxious. And uh, one of the things that microdosing and macrodosing has helped me to do uh, is really I can, I can have those conversations a little bit better with those uh, different quote-unquote voices in my head. Sorry, that's my senior dog talking back there. Well, um, dog, so I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit. You know, your dog does not like to talk about your depression. <laughs> I swear, you should be a service dog. Um, so yes. I'll, I'll hand it over to you and I'll mute it so I can find out what's happening. But I was hoping that you could talk about the symphony itself. Oh, certainly. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I've been working on for the past 25, 30 years has been a way of understanding why it is that we are inconsistent. Because when you're in a relationship, you depend on the other person to be consistent. And they're not. And they think the same of you. They say, wait a moment. I've done this 35 times and you've always said that's okay. Suddenly you're freaked out. What's going on? Okay. So that was the initial problem. What is inconsistency? And then the first clue was, again, look at your own behavior. Have you ever argued with yourself? And the answer is, yeah, of course I have. Who is the other person arguing? And that's a moment when you stop for a moment and say, well, if I'm arguing with myself, that suggests that there's more than one of us in here, okay? It turns out, and, and early psychology absolutely knew this, is we are multiple self beings, meaning we have access to different selves or different aspects of ourselves which some of them are quite different from each other, uh, which is ideal if you're, you know, if you're evolution and you want a, an animal without um, major defensive capacities, physical, to be able to function. So one of the things you notice uh, is, well, let me give you an example with this lovely dog, which is I have, um, I, we have two little dogs, about eight or nine pounds. And when I come home and I'm, I've listened to the news, so that's a bad idea right there. And I am really sad or depressed about, about Yemen, about Haiti, about you know uh, Trump's um, disbelief in science, meaning people aren't getting vaccinated, and how can humanity survive? And I'm in the middle of, there's forest fires, and I get to my gate, and my little dog comes out, and he has a toy in his mouth. Now, we don't know why he thinks this is a great idea, but he's little, and when he wags his tail, his whole rear end moves, and he's got this little toy, and he says, I am so happy to see you. I brought you a toy, okay? Mm -hmm. I have never yet been able to maintain the self that feels crappy because he, he shifts me to a self which is much more like one is with a child, you know, you, we speak different languages when we speak to children because we make that shift because that works for them. Um, so we have the ability to shift when we're healthy 
into the best possible self for the occasion. And that's what your symphony of selves says. Mm -hmm. And what it says for psychedelics is integration is not trying to squash everything back into one, one lump, but mm -hmm. to get yourselves into a better harmony. So you're more likely to be in the right self at the right time. So for instance, at the moment, what I notice when I'm talking is I'm mentioning stories and there are things I haven't really thought about for decades. Um, you know, the, the question uh, with the veterans, for example, and that, that bit of research, that's appropriate for this, for this situation. It's not appropriate um, when my little dog comes up. Mm -hmm. It's not really appropriate when one of my kids wants to talk about something that's happened to them that really matters. It's not really appropriate if I'm trying to work on my taxes. These are all different selves. So your symphony of selves simply says that, says that's the way it is because that's what it looks like. This is not a theory book. This is just the way I do microdosing research, which is I listen to what other people say. And then it turns out if you go into the history of psychology, up until around um, 1906, William James, Freud, Charcot, Jung, everybody was talking selves. Then there was a shift because Freud had some, some problems and he, he, he loses his theory that his childhood clients who were talking about sexual abuse have had sexual abuse because his clients are the children of his friends. Awkward. This is Victorian times, awkward. He comes up with a theory that says it's all in their imagination. And with that, he takes selves away. So we then fall into a period where the, the single self assumption is trying very hard to, to, to make something not, that, that can't work, <clears throat> meaning make, you, make it look like if you're inconsistent, that's not healthy. So we have a theory of single self, deviation from which is psychopathology. That's nuts. And so our book kind of lays out some of the sensible ways of looking at yourself. And it's, a, it's, it's not a self-help book, but there's lots of, is this true for you? And then we have chapters of, if multiple selves are normal, we should find them everywhere. So we then have chapters of art, literature, neuroscience, theology, philosophy, psychotherapy, which have uh, multiple selves at their core. So that's, and, and there, are, there are a number of therapies. The most popular is the um, Internal Family Systems, IFS, which says your parts. Now, they don't quite go as far as we think they could because they say if you if you get your parts working together you can you can go towards having a higher self mm -hmm. and and observationally we don't see any we don't see much data for higher selves um and my question was when someone says well you know i was in my higher self and i say well what's your higher self's favorite restaurant <laughs> and Probably something and it, what you'll notice is my higher self doesn't, doesn't actually have any attributes if I really look at it. So maybe it's an abstraction. But with or without that, what we found is if you acknowledge you have selves, you're, you, one is you observe other people more accurately, especially in psychotherapy. You, you become forgiving of the parts of yourself that you don't appreciate, that other parts don't like. And then you notice that you're more compassionate for your partner. Now, I should mention my little dog, who I've just made into this little saint of joy. Um, when he sees a larger dog, he flings himself towards that larger dog, intending to hurt them. It's really dumb. Okay, that's why we use a leash. Um, he's a rescue. I don't know what his trauma was as a rescue, but he's, he's kept it. And so he has a side, which is really scary. He has very sharp little tiny teeth, but he's willing to use them. And since he'll go for your ankle, you know, you're, you're in trouble. Um, 
but I don't say I have a vicious dog. I have a dog who with people he trusts is the most loving little being we've met and has a side which is truly scary. And then I think of myself and what I've done under extreme stress to other people, which I, I would not like to be that person very often. <coughs> so that's the idea. Yeah. And it seems to me it's an essential understanding if you're working with other people, particularly, see, in therapy, here's the problem, is what you need to be sure of in therapy is the person you're talking to is the person who's done the things that brought them into therapy. Here's the problem. Let's take alcoholism. Very problem. You know, we, if you work with vets, you work with alcoholics part of the time. Okay. The alcoholic has a wonderful time, gets into trouble, gets into fights, and falls asleep. In the morning, somebody wakes up with a hangover who feels terrible, who feels guilty and ashamed of the behavior, and goes to therapy. The alcoholic doesn't have any interest in therapy, which is why psychotherapy works so poorly with alcoholics. Now, if you go to an AA meeting, which is always a very moving and wonderful event, the first thing they do <coughs> is bring the alcoholic self into the meeting. Hi, my name is Jim and I'm an alcoholic, okay? That's who shows up. Mm. And people tell each other stories of what it's like being an alcoholic so that the alcoholics, and you tell your story about all the reasons, all the justifications, all the terrible things that happened to you and you're an alcoholic. And someone then takes a story like yours, only their life is way worse than yours, just horrible. And they end their story by saying, and I've been sober for 12 years. Okay. That's understanding how you, you bring the, the right self at the right time and you get very different results. So you asked a question of, about the book. You got, <laughs> you got a long answer. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you for that summary. There's, um, I know you're probably familiar with the Simpsons. There's a, one particular scene that I really love where Homer drinks this uh, gigantic jar of um, like vodka and mayonnaise. And I think someone remarked, you know, should you have done that? And Homer says, well, that's a problem for future me. It sure sucks to be that guy. <laughs> right now, I often think about that when uh, you start talking about the, you know, the wrong person showing up and then you have to deal with it afterwards. Um, well, so the wrong you, person showing up, you see, that's the nice thing is your goal is to get everyone inside here working for the benefit of the family. Right. So that so that if the wrong person shows up, there should be some way um, in which you can you can you can literally learn to switch. Um, and and I remember early on in, in my marriage, and we've been married over fifty years, so something's working. Um, we would Dorothy would accept some social engagement with people that I didn't like. Okay, friends from her before we were got together, and I would think. I'm going to go, I'm going to have a really bad time because I know these people and I don't like them. And then I would think the next thing is then we'll be leaving the party and I will get into the car and she will say, how was it? And I'll say it was really bad. So I'm right. Okay. I managed to be right and have a bad evening. Then I looked at this, this is before I understood selves. And I looked at it, I thought, what if I say, I don't like these people, but I'm capable of having as good a time as I can. And there may be parts of them that I don't know. There may be, I may be able to be in another room. Who knows? They may have a little eight pound dog that brings toys. Who knows? So I would go then and say, well, whatever happens, I'm going to, since I'm here, it's my time. I'm going to have as good a time as possible. The only drawback is then when we get in the car and Dorothy says, how was it? And I said, I really had a good time. She said, even though you don't like them, isn't it wonderful you could have a good time? Let's see them next month. And I think, no, no, no. <laughs> I, have to be, I have to be more careful here. Um, but you can see what I'm saying is this is a way of how do you work with yourself? And what you notice is if you're going to be in the wrong self <clears throat> at the wrong time, <clears throat> you can do something about it. And that's, again, 
what the book does in the last third is it gives you lots and lots and lots of ways people have learned how to how to how to get off it. And in fact, from your childhood, and I'll bet <clears throat> you were taught something which is actually how to shift selves. What you were told is count to ten. Mm. Okay. And you're a child and you think, what the why should I count to 10? All I want to do is punch my little brother out because he deserves it. And in counting to 10, you are actually shifting into a calm place because there's no content. There's no emotional content. You're breathing. You're doing a little breathing exercise. And at the end of 10, very often, you will find that you're in a better place. So we have built into our culture at a remarkably early time in our lives how to do the kind of switching that makes your life work okay yeah and it seems to me a lot of um people tend to get plagued by not being able to let go of the wrong self um, well they, if they don't think they have another self to go to what are they they're stuck yeah. you know it's like the other equivalent is suck it up Okay. Now, sucking it up means that you repress it, that you have all those negative biochemical reactions, that you develop a negative habit, which is you don't cope, you suck it up. Um, and eventually, eventually, the parts of your system that are being injured won't accept that anymore. And then you have all the problems that come from that. What, we're, what, what is true is you may have among yourselves <clears throat> one that is pathological. That's the one that needs help. But that doesn't mean that all of you is that way. See, most of us, for example, have a relative at a holiday that we all know not to discuss certain subjects with, okay? Most of us have that. Don't talk religion with Uncle Abner. Because what happens is you say something about religion to Uncle Abner, and he flips into the self that is a totally fixated in that area. And he doesn't know how to get out of that. But the rest of Uncle Abner is really just fine. So we, we again, work with ourselves, whether and it's just easier if you understand what you're doing. So when it comes to this idea of uh, multiple selves, and we call it like a, yeah, I think you call it like a, a symphony, you know, because it's going to be harmonious. You have everyone playing their role. Right. Um, is there a conductor? Like, is there someone orchestrating the symphony? Or well, is that one of the selves? Well, that's the only reason that I find that title awkward. And I had a big fight with my author and editor, and it works in every other way. If Let me give you the actual truth, which is when a conductor dies, very often the orchestra plays a program of the conductor's favorite pieces without a conductor mm. as a tribute to the conductor, okay? Which is the conductor, if you think of it another way, is simply another part of the orchestra. And in there are occasions when you need to be conducting the parts of yourself, but mostly it's self on self. So um, the, the nice part of the word symphony is each instrument is its own instrument. The oboe doesn't try to be the violin. It tries to be the best oboe it can be. And if it's the best oboe, it inspires the violin to be the best violin. Mm. So what you're after, see, we're, we could have called it your happy family of selves, but then people would think it's about some television program that went off several years ago and you forgot whether you saw it or not. Now, so in this example, if the oboe, starts slacking right and one of the selves go out of out of proportion i guess that's when you start implementing you know different techniques to try to absolutely elbow better and, and that's also what a you know that's one of the jobs of the conductor is to notice when there's some disharmony that's its job um right. but but it, it but the conductor doesn't have an instrument doesn't make any sound okay mm -hmm. so you say well if the conductor is so important why don't we just how about, do we really need the orchestra? No, we, we obviously need the orchestra. Do we need the conductor? It's not as obvious, okay? And the, 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 the question for some people is, is there a kind of smarter person who decides who should be you know, on stage? And 
maybe. But for most of us, counting to 10, realizing that you're, you're one, one of the things we do, for example, and this, this came up again and again during the COVID lockdowns, is people who are used to not only going to work, but dressing for work. Okay? Yeah. And why do you dress for work? Mm -hmm. Okay. On that self. Because you want to get into your work self. Mm. And why do you, you know, you enter the house and being a man here, you take off a jacket, you may take off a tie, you undo a shirt. What is that saying? That's saying, I'm no longer the work person, I'm the home person. Mm. You know, you don't want to greet your children the way you you work with people at your office. They don't they don't work that way. And you know that. So, you know, nobody, you don't go to your office and roll on the ground and say, you're the cutest little thing I've ever seen. Okay. But you do do that when you come home and it's your three-year-old daughter. Both are totally healthy, sane reactions in the right place. Okay. Yeah. When I'm thinking about that idea of like different uniforms, being able to uh, express different selves reminds me of like, when I was in, you know, elementary school, uh, and the teacher wanted the students to listen, say, "All right, turn, like, turn your your hearing ears on," and then, like, you know, like everyone will do this, and then. Oh, and she's so good! So she's so I good! Talk. I love that. We're, we're, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a note after this program. I love that. What a great teacher, right? And also, if you notice that, um, you know, you're all, let's say you're able to sit at a desk and learn that way, and then it's recess, and everybody gets up and suddenly chaos, pandemonium, yeah. screaming, laughing. And then research is over and very often kids say, okay, now I'll put the recess self back and I'll be the, the student self again, but not for too long because it gets impatience. My recess, my recess self says, I want some time. And if you deny a self time, it will eventually turn into some kind of pathology. Yeah. Um, so we're getting close to the end of the event, and I do want us to be able to wrap up with some audience Q&A. Absolutely. Um, and thank you, Dr. Fadiman. Thank you, Jim, for the incredible insight. Um, with that, feel free, uh, attendees, to put some questions, whether they be in the uh, chat or in the uh, Q&A at the very bottom. So we have 10 in the Q&A uh, so far. Um, if you'd like to come on stage, uh, feel free just to raise your hand, and we'll bring people up one at a time. Um, okay, let's let's see what we can do. Totally. So let's see. So a question from Michelle: What do you recommend for fibromyalgia and neuropathy? Um, any insight there? Uh, yeah, we'll probably start with CBD <laughs> for <laughs> openers. Um, what we found for pain: This is chronic pain uh, for microdosing. What we, what we get, we get two groups of reports. Some people report alleviation of pain, but more people report that the, if they scale their pain one to 10, that it's still the same place on the scale, but it doesn't bother them the same way. And what they report is it feels as if the pain is in me. I am not the, you know, I'm not in pain, but I have pain. And it's a subtle shift where the pain doesn't take up as much space in consciousness. So that's that's our report for microdosers. And there, I feel like there, there might be some overlap here potentially. It's very it's a stretch, but I think you you mentioned specific unique cases where like uh, the post-repetitive neuralgia associated with shingles or uh, with the shingles flare. Oh oh shingles, no shingles is a specialty because shingles is wonderful. Shingles is um, if you've had chicken pox, the virus goes and hides somewhere, maybe in your nerve cells. I'm just yeah. talking what the medical textbooks say. And then in your middle age or later, you may get something called shingles, which has looks nothing like chickenpox and is often pain around the abdomen. And you can have lesions everywhere, even places we can't discuss on public media. But, and there's a vaccine that you can take at first symptoms. But if you don't get it within a week or two, and for a number of people, it's a terribly debilitating, painful condition caused by a virus, okay? What's fascinating is we have a couple of cases of people in that position 
two microdosed. And the one that, that blew me away was somebody literally in Zambia who was at the level of pain where there was no position of, that he could sleep in. Any place he lay was pain. 45 minutes after one microdose, his pain was gone. Now, those of you who with a lot of medical training haven't the faintest idea what happened and you're with the rest of us, okay? <laughs> because we really don't understand how that could have happened. And we have other cases that are very similar. So that's a particular kind of pain with a particular kind of cause for which we happen to have a few cases. If someone had come up to me and said, what do you think about shingles? I'd have said, that's ridiculous. They have nothing to do with anything related to microdosing except that they work. But see, that's the nice thing about uh, real world evidence. Real world evidence is it's worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, there's no point in pursuing it because it can't happen. But since it does, um, it shifts your willingness to explore. So good question. Yeah, and just with that, I mean, uh, do you know if there are any people looking into how, what, what, like, what that relationship is? Because I, I have a, I have a theory in mind, but I wasn't sure if there's anything you well, know. I, I was once on a, on, a, on a show with a couple of physicians and I threw this out and they both had theories instantly, yeah. which had very little overlap. Mm -hmm. So um, you're, you know, uh, who knows? And right. when I tell something like this, I hope there's someone who is already, you know, researching herpes zoster, which is the technical term. And I hope they say, whoa, that makes no sense at all. But since I, the physician, have taken a bunch of psychedelics, I'm no longer so rigid as I was in my medical training. Maybe I'll ask my my herpes patients, my, uh, my shingles patients, have they ever tried a psychedelic? Mm. Um, it's unlikely that the major research people will take it on because it seems it doesn't, it, there's not a good theory to start with. But maybe if you can come up with a good theory, you can suggest to the local hospitals that they go for it. I'll shoot you an email after this. I have something written okay. up. Um, okay. I see that Chris has his hand up. I know he asked a question earlier, so I'll go ahead and bring him on. Thank you, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, it's such an honor to talk to you. Thank you. Um, the short version is I have been in recovery 12 years. I work in recovery now. I started doing due diligence last year with your book and then the San Francisco Psychedelic Society yep. and, and have been attending PIR, the 12 Step Fellowship Psychedelics in, in Recovery and really mm -hmm. stepping my way in. And I had my first high dose with a, with a experienced individual last weekend. And um, I just, I didn't see the mind expanding stuff. I didn't see all that stuff. I just saw, I had the tools to kind of set my cluttered self aside and yep. use the tools for eight hours that I've been building for 12 years. Yep. And I had a lasting effect where I'm not have I, I still have my thoughts. I'm back to being me, but I'm not having that neurological impact with my thoughts. Like I'm on the healing process. Yep. So my question for you is I've, I've read your stuff. I've read Paul Stamets. I've listened to others. I'm, I'm starting this, the, the micro dosing process with the psilocybin. And I'm really curious about, should I be stacking it? What, what, well, just what are your opinions on stacking it with Stack, like stacking for those of you who don't know what just went on fascinating story, by the way, and I do have a question for you. Um, stacking is taking the microdose with some other mushrooms and there's various stacks. One is Paul Stamets suggests lion's mane as another mushroom, and then some niacin, which he says will increase the um, kind of availability. It'll go to more, uh, it opens up your, your vein, your capillaries, okay? Um, why not? It seems, you know, the evidence is that, it, that stacking doesn't do any harm that we've ever found. And it comes from a very smart person, Paul Stamets. Um, why not? Okay, now remember, um, You'd have to make your own stack, but you're also involved with a number of groups who might be able to help you with the, with the people you've, you know, who might know someone who can help you. And my question to you is, uh, you mentioned that there's a group of, um, I guess, psychedelics in recovery. What was it? Yeah, it's a, it's a 12 step. I'm going to put it in, in the chat here for everyone. Okay. It's psychedelicsinrecovery.org. Okay. 
Okay. And it's a 12 step and it's basically people um, from all kinds of 12 step and people who are not, who are new to it. Um, it it's, it's been fascinating because it's allowed me to really slow step this and yeah. I'm, cause I'm doing this from a recovery standpoint and I'm a okay. veteran also who on the outside works with veterans in some capacity. So I, I really appreciate what you said, but yeah, I wasn't trying to promote that here, but since we no, met, no, 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 you weren't promoting it. You were just telling me something I didn't know that makes such good sense. Um, because then you can say, you know, my name is Chris and I'm an alcoholic and I'm using psychedelics in recovery. And everyone in the room says, yeah, right. <laughs> well, actually in our readings, just like, you know, an AA meeting, which I'm a member of, yeah. um, we consider that an outside issue. So those of us that are in PIR don't go preaching it back to our 12. No, not at all. But thank you for sharing that it exists. And thank you for the work you're doing with veterans and even more. I'm thrilled for your recovery in every way. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. I have another question well, here from uh, Dr. Kevin Lanzo. He asks, Dr. Fadiman, what are some optimistic clues you might look for in an ethical, well-meaning company attempting to do psychedelic therapy the quote-unquote right way, whatever that means to you? <laughs> well, the problem is even the, even the crummy companies <clears throat> it's more about they're setting themselves up more for money than for, for healing. But unless you do healing, you really aren't going to exist. One of the companies I'm working with um, is called Wisana, W-E-S-A-N-A. -A. Their particular interest is helping people with traumatic brain injury recover using psychedelics and other modalities. The head of the company is a an ex Stanley Cup hockey player who was retired at age 30 because he had too many concussions and having tried every other um, treatment that he could find ended up inadvertently being given psychedelics then it helped. So um, that's a company I'm actually working with um, in terms of their, their treatment protocols and their feeling it isn't just psychedelics, it's part of a total protocol. So that's what, and what's nice is <clears throat> if you look at the literature for psychedelics and traumatic brain injury, there isn't any. Except if you go to real world evidence, there is some. So he's starting from the real world evidence of his own behavior and his own changes. And there are other people who, who I know uh, who also show improvement after, after the end of all conventional therapies. Okay, we don't know about starting people right off with, you know, if you have a traumatic brain injury, we don't know enough about it, but it's an area clearly that feels to me highly honorable. Thank you for that question and answer. Uh, we have Ian asking, what are the studies done or being conducted on bipolar, depression, anxiety, schizophrenic bipolar, and other common mental health issues that can go under the radar? I know a lot of the research now is with depression and anxiety and right. prime, usually the folks that are being screened out are the ones right. with bipolar or schizophrenic bipolar disorder. All, all of the people who might have a problem six months after the treatment and then blame it on the treatment are eliminated from the research. That's called stacking the deck. And it's both, it's okay, but that's why real world evidence is important. The real world evidence, and it's very easy to go, is you go to, on Facebook and look for some of the bipolar groups, which I did, and you say to the host, can I ask the group if they have any psychedelic experience, since I know they were not allowed in any studies. And because they are part of the 36 million people, a lot of them, of course, report having taken psychedelics. And for bipolar, for example, which used to be called, I think more accurately, manic depression, what they say is don't use psychedelics, microdose or anything else during your manic phase because it will, it, will, it will make that more. But it does seem to help, according to the bipolar people, taking it during their depressive phase. So, the, and it's an interesting question. There aren't any studies because everyone who does studies is afraid. And I once asked someone since you all say you won't take in people with these conditions. What's your evidence? 
And they, I got a few papers back, all of which said, I thought it was probably sensible not to have them. <laughs> okay, so we really have the faintest idea of how valuable successful psychedelics could be. But remember, we probably wouldn't have tried post-traumatic stress disorder people um, unless it had come through the MDMA route, which is different. MDMA is not a psychedelic. You don't lose your personality, your self-definition. What you lose, what you're allowed to do is the trauma moves from stage front to memory. You don't lose the terrible trauma. You just don't use it the same way. So that, so that there are different substances for different conditions. And we, the problem with your question, a very good one, is since nobody's allowed to, to take these, to do the normal formal studies, we don't know yet. And so therefore we're back to citizen science and um, that's my resource. Thank you. Uh, we have another question, essentially two questions that really overlap from Anna and, uh, and John. Uh, really just asking about your thoughts on complementing macrodosing and microdosing in between macrodosing sessions. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, on just combining those two? Okay, well, understand I'm not a clinician. I didn't get a license, thank God. <laughs> and uh, I listened to everybody's reports. There's an unpublished study where someone who, one of the people who gives a pretty good microdosing course, someone interviewed like 50 of, of his students. And many of them said they had uh, decided that a high dose every some period of time was a good idea with microdosing. And a lot of them didn't. So the answer is it's out there and it's a citizen science question. And I don't have enough information to say whether it's good or not. Um, I happen to like microdosing because it doesn't scare anybody. And you don't need protection, meaning you don't need to be in a safe place and, and pick your music and get your intentions. If you're going to macro, micro, macro dose, you behave as carefully and as healthily as you can, because even though you're a seasoned psychonaut, if you, just like you're a seasoned driver, you can still have a serious accident if you don't pay attention. Thank you. Um, and just another question off that is, uh, you know, for, for some folks, I've heard that microdosing actually elevates some of their anxiety. Uh, it's very, to me, uncommon, you know, is this, that's the indication for some folks to use well, the, the yeah. microdose? Or your thoughts well, about we actually, I believe on our, on microdosingpsychedelics.com, make a comment that we don't recommend it if you just have anxiety. When you have depression, you often have anxiety because your life isn't working. But just anxiety, it looks like, and we don't know, for some people, either <clears throat> their anxiety literally increases or their awareness of their anxiety increases. We have no way to tell. So the general rule of thumb is if it's only anxiety, our advice is not to microdose. If I look at, say, some of the results from the Netherlands, the Microdosing Institute of the Netherlands, they have about 3,000 or I think 5,000 people they've worked with, and they have a coaching model, so they keep track of people. Very often with coaching, um, people seem to be able to work, work with anxiety uh, much better. So that's a very guarded yes. Uh, and the nice thing is, is if you microdose, and you feel not very, you feel it's not appropriate for you, stopping is very easy. Um, and you're not gonna be in any trouble. And by the way, if a small dose is good, a little larger dose isn't better. The goal is how little can you use and so forth. And what we found when, when we, we've asked people to use it for a month and tell us about it, that's how citizen science works. But we also say after, a month of doing it with our protocol, which is one day on and two days without, what are you doing now? And what we found is most people were using it less often than that. So it is the opposite of addictive. And the reason behind the one day on, two days off is primarily for tolerance purposes? Um, well, predictability? 
Well, actually, it's, it, was a, it originally wasn't a clinical protocol at all. Oh, nice. It was a research protocol that I developed because I saw people were having two-day effects. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were saying, wow, the second day is even better. Okay. That was just information. So I was trying to find out how it works. So I said, well, why don't you take the third day off so you can come back to base. So mm -hmm. when you take it on the fourth day, you'll be able to tell me more information. So it was a total research protocol. Mm -hmm. But, you know, around the world, it's very popular as a protocol because it's safe, zero tolerance. <clears throat> and for many people, after a month or so, <clears throat> that third day isn't distinguishable the same way as it was at the beginning because the improvements in functioning have stabilized. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so but again, it's, it's you have to pick both what's what is now being called your sweet spot, which is what works for you. That's the right dose. How often that's the right timing. We have another question here by Deborah asking, uh, what can long time shamanic and other non-licensed practitioners do to maintain so sovereignty as medicalization pushes them out? It's a great question. Oh boy. <laughs> um, the only, the only one I know that survived was the Native American church, which used peyote, and it took a Supreme Court case to do that. The medical profession eats everything. <laughs> um, however, the, the, the nat natural shamanic indigenous methods are being more and more accepted because whoever asked the question is already doing it and has a clientele, and they probably aren't going to go away when psychedelics are more legal. If all they're doing is saying, I'm giving you psychedelics in a shamanic context, and it's not going to be very different from some other context, then that's kind of like going to Walmart or Costco. Um, not a great difference. So for the shamanic people, good work, basically successful therapists have a lot of clients. And one of the things we know is successful therapists, if you take five different schools of psychotherapy, and there's dozens of them, and you get really the most, you know, the most highly regarded practitioners, and you get them to talk to each other, they have a lovely time, they like each other, they understand each other, because they're all doing in their own way the same thing. If you talk to people who are less good, they all are mad at each other and say that person's theory is wrong and they do the wrong practices and so forth. Uh, it's amazing how many different ways there are of healing. And then just to piggyback off that, I think if we can have, a, there's a way to just have a foundation of any decriminalization language, that's what can preserve, you know, the, the autonomy of these underground practitioners or non-licensed practitioners. One of, the, one of the things about decriminalization is we're now realizing that peyote is not to be decriminalized. Mm -hmm. Meaning we want peyote to only be available to people who are practitioners or Native American church or have other you know, uh, correct reasons for using peyote because peyote is in short supply. And if you take a peyote button that's the size of you know, my fingernail, it's about eight years old. Wow. It's a very, 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 very slow growing cactus. And Michael Pollan has a new book out, um, My Mind on Plants. And he took mescaline, but he took mescaline from the San Pedro cactus, which is not endangered and which he was growing in his own garden. So decriminalization is an interesting word at the moment. Uh, we have another attendee asking uh, primarily where they can uh, share their real life experiences. So that way it'd be most beneficial uh, regarding their personal use of psilocybin. Uh, just a plug in, you know, <laughs> Silo Health, we offer free integration workshops on a weekly basis. So feel free to, you know, register online there. You know, we don't even, we don't ask for donations. Just come in. We have a couple uh, uh, therapists in the team. Uh, it's not, it's not mental health services, but can be very therapeutic to share with the community. So we offer those on a weekly basis. Feel free to check that out uh, online. And then right. you have any support there? 
as well. No, no, I was just thrilled at you. I thought, what am I going to say? <laughs> 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 okay, uh, let's see. We have, a hand, we have a handful more questions. I, I do want to be respectful of your time. I know we are 10 no, minutes. Let's, let's do a few more questions. They're really good questions. Totally, yes. Um, would anyone like to raise their hand or we'll continue going with the list? I'll continue going with the list and see, unless I see a hand raised. Uh, we have another question. Uh, I, I definitely want to hear your thoughts on this is when do you, and I asked this question actually at a recent integration workshop. So we really love your insight here. Uh, when do you know the integration work is complete and another high dose experience can be pursued? <laughs> oh my, my, oh, yeah. my. What, what comes to mind is I, I worked with a homeopathic physician many, many years ago. And I was asking that kind of question. He said, well, why don't you tell me when you're healthy enough and then we'll stop. And I thought, okay, I got that it was the wrong question. Um, I think the part of the reason, if you have a, if you're, if you want to take a high dose, the question is not how soon can I do it, but what is my reason for doing it? And there's the, there's an old, kind of story in the psychedelic world, and it's from John Paul Sartre, who says, when you call God on the telephone, after he answers your questions, you hang up. Okay, so the question is, is there something I need from a psychedelic, or do I have something that'll be just fun? Um, is it something that I want to do with particular people? Is it a situation that I want? And I was just listening to a comic, um, Someone who is a, a mushroom friend of mine sent me a YouTube of someone on Saturday Night Live talking about this great date he was going to have. And this wonderful date was going to have mushrooms with him. And it was going to be just so cool. And so he takes mushrooms and he has a really hard trip. Um, and she's never had mushrooms. And at one point, he's struggling with the, you know, with the dark forces from the universe that are filling his body. And he hears her saying, because she's sitting next to a tree, says, oh, this tree is so beautiful. This is the most beautiful tree I've ever seen. I'm so happy. And he's thinking, wait a moment. <laughs> I'm supposed to be having the good time. Mm -hmm. um, and then it has a nice ending where, where the, the feminine spirit comes in and drives the evil spirits out of his body. And he has a, a good evening, as he said. And then I started to come down. So uh, the answer is probably after you think it's a good time. That's probably the best answer. It's after you decide this is really the right time, wait a couple of weeks and see what, why you wanted to do it and whether that was right. Thank you. Okay, um, let's go with the one last question. This is a fun one, I guess. Uh, what's your favorite mushroom? <laughs> well, you mean Amos or Charlie? Which one? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's a little bit... Um, if I were a mushroom grower, I would absolutely have it. And um, what, I, what I know is there's, you know, it's like there's, there's no bad mushrooms. Okay, and, and I still remember I came out of LSD. I came out of micrograms of a chemical made by some guy in a, in a, in a business capitalist company in Switzerland who who, whose company said, this is an incredibly powerful drug. We have no idea how to make money out of it. So we're going to put it out and we're going to say to people, we'll send you some if you'll tell us what you used it for. Okay, and poor Sandoz did that for like a decade and they never came up with an economic model. So I came out of, you know, um, evil synthetics. So all mushrooms, what I know is all mushrooms are good and the mycelium, which connects all mushrooms are the only reason there's any trees or plants even on the planet. So um, I strongly recommend a book called Entangled Life, which just totally turns your head upside down about how life really functions on the planet. And you end up saying you can't say mushroom because it's connected and it's connected and it's connected and it's connected and it's connected. So it's a wonderful question. And uh, I have no idea what my favorite mushroom is, but I think it's a little bit 
um, there's a musical and one of the songs says, when I'm not near the one I love, I love the one I'm near. <laughs> wow. So uh, we just had James Fenneman sing uh, for us. So I think I, I can't think of a better better no. place to close. I don't. I, don't I think, think we better close. If he's starting to sing, let's watch out. Well, I mean, if if you'd like to do a few bars, like please, this is this is no no, no bars and no saloons, and no taverns, none of that. <laughs> Well, uh, Dr. Fadiman, uh, Jim, it's been such a pleasure and an honor speaking with you today. Um, before we let you go, um, if uh, you wouldn't mind uh, letting us know about the new book, uh, if you wouldn't mind repeating the name, um, the the site where people can go and relate For, to the American oh, your, your symphony of anything selves. else that you'd like to plug. Yeah, your Symphony of Selves and the Psychedelic Explorer's Guide are both published by Inner Traditions. And um, I'd rather you'd go to a bookstore and if you don't go to a bookstore, uh, there's a very large company named after half naked women with with uh, warlike capacities that you might that's it's on there. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and your website as well, um, Dr. Fadden. Actually, uh, you can't buy it from my website because I really support publishers. Okay. Are you, are you still gathering information about microdosing on your website? Absolutely. Though? Anyone that wants to send me a note about their microdosing, I will be deeply grateful. Awesome. Uh, with that, thank you again, sir. Uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Um, well, it's, it's really, what's really been good about this is both of you coming from very different places and the questions um, were really wonderful. So that's for me what I, when I'm learning I really learn what kind of questions do people have rather than what do I want to tell people. And so I'm really impressed. Um, I can't say the quality of the questions. That's not, that's kind of inappropriate. The value of the questions were very, very good. So thank you. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.